Hello Chameleon Wranglers, this is Bill Strand. Welcome back to the Chameleon Academy. Today I bring you the second half of the interview with Peter Nechas on fogging chameleons. Now if you haven't seen the first half of this interview, that's okay. The both parts stand on their own. The first one is about hydration in the wild and this second interview, which we are going to be seeing today, is about implementing chameleon hydration in captivity. How do we fog in captivity? And the question, of course, is what is important about their natural condition and how do we recreate that portion of the natural condition? And of course, we've got to do that with the tools that are available to us right now. And so let's go ahead and bring Peter on and let's talk about implementing fogging in captivity. Please join me in welcoming Peter Nechas to the Chameleon Academy podcast. Let's go ahead and start talking about implementing a nighttime or a a a, a vapor fog mist humidifying uh, hydration scheme here. Uh, and I want to start off with what's the difference between using a humidifier and a fogger? A little bit black and white, black and white, because the terminology is also not set properly. Yeah, but black and whitely set. A humidifier is a, uh, an instrument which is usually used for humans to raise the humidity of their uh, sleeping room uh, to desired levels. So it technically can either simply use vapor or it can use even fog, which is just not used for inhaling, but it is used for being then dissolved in the in the in the air to raise the humidity okay and fogger as a specific term is a name of a device which uh, using uh, different methods as i said either piezoelectric crystal vibrations or uh, uh, like uh, pressurized uh, spraying of the water creates fog which is a uh, which is relatively stable in case of proper temperature yeah, and stays in this uh, state until it actually gets where it should uh, get. It means to the cage, it then can fill the cage or even you do not need to care always uh, just to have all the cage full of the uh, of the fog, you know. Some chameleons do, and, and you know, it, we have uh, lots of reports that chameleon can actually adjust even to a, a stream of fog which is falling down from the ceiling, you know, and they find the spot where they just sit and, and the stream is, is running uh, down the face mm -hmm. and they just breathe in the fog while the, the rest of the cage is not that affected out of uh, out of it and and this is this is what what, what actually happens so so humidifier uh, raises the humidity you can use it for instance in in the um, united states we have lots of colleagues which live in very very dry environments you know and if you if you keep chameleons at daytime uh, 15 percent um, uh, humidity it is it is challenging them because uh, it, it causes the loss of water, of course, at the daytime. So we might raise the humidity so that they can keep a little bit more balance. Yeah? But if you want them to get hydrated, you need to provide fog at lower, at lower temperatures. This is, this is the difference. All right. Well, uh, one thing I don't have the answer for, and I'm just going to see if you do, uh, for when we have that, like, stream uh the stream of fog and so yeah. for everybody especially if you use a screen cage uh the fog dissipates very quickly so if you have a fogger yeah. you end up with this column of fog that comes into the cage and it dissipates after a foot or so yeah uh if you do that after the chameleon falls asleep and you start at say at midnight and you turn it off at 6 a.m uh the chameleon is never awake when that column of fog exists but it won't be more than a night or two before that chameleon sleeps where that fog column is. How in the world does a chameleon know where that fog column exists? <laughs> Do you have an answer? Well, 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 I have found an answer in some cases, okay? And uh, the, the case is 
despite of the fact that chameleons tend to sleep during the night time, they're of course not dead, okay? <laughs> so even a tiny, a little amount of light, which can be caused by, you know, uh, like remnant uh, um, uh, light from the street, uh, through the window to the space where you have the chameleon or uh, a, a small LED uh, on your computer that is just blinking, you know, can under circumstances give enough light for the uh, spectacular eye of the chameleon to find at least the rough orientation in the environment, you know, and find a spot. We have had uh, with a colleague, we have had a, a male um, uh, cast chameleon, uh, the uh, Triocerus Hönelai, which was in such a cage where once we switched on a little uh, the light that was really like the, 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 for us it was not even enough for for finding our way uh, along the case yeah but it was enough for it to find it once we switched it off and it was in the full darkness it was erratic sometimes it it, it was in the in the stream and sometimes not mm. so yeah the chameleons uh, when they are sleeping they are not dead yeah and they can regulate even at night yeah, uh, and uh, of course, uh, is it is it then similar to what we, they uh, see in the in the wild? Of course, yes. You have the moon, and the moon has also the phases, right? Uh, they have um, uh, phase of the moon when when there's no light at all, uh, so they they usually do not move. And if the light specifically at uh, at equator, the intensity of the of the moonlight is much more intense than what we are used to in, uh, let's say, Central Europe. You know, uh, even the humans can walk in the in this uh, light of a full moon in in Africa and in Madagascar as well. You know, so chameleons with their spectacular eyes might have enough uh, enough um, uh, light to adjust. Uh, why I say this? I have also other proof to say they really adjust because. Uh, in, in uh, several occasions, you can find, for instance, a chameleon which sits in a position that uh, is uh, uh, like um, exposed to uh, uh, moonlight, yeah. And then the and the other side, it is not exposed to the moonlight. And you come to the the animal, and if you look at uh, it from the, per the perspective of the moonlight, you know, it is dark green. And if you look from the other side, it's lime yellow. Yeah, the chameleon is half and half. In Socotra, and I have published this, this, these pictures, the, the moonlight came straight from the top of the, of the chameleon. So, so I have photographs of chameleons being dark on the top and from, the, from below they were lime yellow. Yeah? So, so they can adjust and they, can, they, they, they use the light uh, either through their vision or also through some uh, sensory uh, system of the skin so that they can adjust. Yeah? Uh, whether this is the ultimate answer to your question, I'm not sure. Yeah? But <laughs> the fact is, they tend to find out the, the spot and they tend to really yep. you know, inhale fog at the nighttime. And I have to say uh, that this is actually then enough for them. Because as we said, you know, the skin, whether it is forked or not, does not matter. It is impenetrable by what it's, it's perfectly isolating the internal environment from it. So if the water gets around the nostrils and they can inhale it, yeah? So a little tiny stream of, of fog is enough for them to hydrate and feel proper. Yeah, uh, and you do not need to, you know, to fill the whole cage with the, you know, heavy uh, fog and so on. I have even seen some animals which were not used to fogging, so that they, they get got nervous. They got nervous when the fog was too heavy and too intense. They tended even to crawl at night uh, through the environment. What does it mean? Um, you know, uh, it is also the matter, as, as all, all the aspects we have in, in, in the, in the um, captive environment um, design, it is not the matter fog yes or no, 100% or zero, it is also about the variation and about the natural way how the fog actually comes and goes in the environment. It's not like that the, the fog comes and then it sticks for, for seven hours, you know. It comes and, and it goes, you know. It comes for one hour, they sit in the fog and they cannot do anything, just breathe in, and then uh, the fog uh, like goes away. Specifically, 
in areas which are uh, on mountains and on mountain slopes where actually the fog equals to clouds you know you have a you have a you have a slope you know and at the, the at the uh, uh, beginning of the night the clouds are high the lower the temperature is the lower the clouds are and they just you know, go down along the slope and here's the chameleon sitting so the cloud comes to the chameleon and then it goes lower okay so two hours later no fog fog is below and then once the environment towards the, the morning is getting uh, uh, again more um, more uh, warm and get 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 uh, higher temperature the, the the fog slowly slowly climbs up uh, the, the mountains and 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 uh, sometimes sits on the top of the mountains or even dwells above the the peaks of the mountains uh, whenever you are in madagascar in the hills or whenever you visit uh, the landscape uh, typical for that like uh, tanzania or kenya you can see it yeah like the clouds are coming down and up along the uh, along the slope so the uh, the uh, important thing is also not to you know just switch it on and switch it off yeah the the good thing is uh, to uh, provide a little variation uh, and uh, uh, ex expose them to uh, on and off and on and off even during one night and even uh, playing around the right level of hydration with the intensity and length of the exposure to the fog so it it, it comes to to uh, the extent that you can switch the fogger for a couple of nights. It's not always necessary. I said that the majority of the nights are foggy in the environments of chemins. Not that all the night the fog is heavy there. Okay. And uh, the way how to adjust, uh, I have researched in, in, in another experiment, which might be of your interest as well. Have you been able to show that chameleons can stay fully hydrated long term using only fog absolutely absolutely right. yes i would like to hear yeah. how you determine that <clears throat> absolutely yes look it again comes uh, from the observation in in the wild and it comes again uh, to uh, compare what we believed before and what people believed uh, about chameleons and other reptiles before we came up with these ideas and what is actually the state of nation now uh, again, eight, ten years ago, <coughs> uh, we had one of the biggest issues, uh, how to hydrate the chameleon, you know? So we actually like poured water in whatever form and whatever, whatever amount was available mm -hmm. because the, the typical picture of an ill or mistreated or not well chameleon was a dehydrated one, yeah? So there was the uh, period where uh, where all the misters and then the mist kinks and and uh, automatic or manual devices came to hydrate the chameleon uh, using liquid water because we, we did not know about uh, uh, about fog uh, at, at that time. Now uh, uh, this uh, this uh, the way of hydration uh, led us to a black and white uh, conclusion and actually some of the veterinarians which by definition uh, are more used to treating uh, animals from the captivity and not dwelling out there in, in, in the bush you know were a little bit simplifying and uh, at that time it, it, it brought us forward what they said was white urate good orange urate bad okay which uh, at that time was a, a, a good, a good uh, diagnostic, uh, uh, say, um, uh, scale that we could use for roughly saying, hey, this chameleon is fine, uh, this chameleon is not fine. Now, uh, <laughs> I, I run uh, about two decades uh, through the environment, seeing chameleons also pooping and urinating and so on and so on. And I did not come with, up with the idea that I have to photograph a poop and urine of chameleon, that <laughs> someone would be ever, uh, ever <laughs> interested in that. So uh, in the last decade, I do. <laughs> Before, I did not. Yeah, <clears throat> despite of the fact I seen it and and uh, and some of the ideas I remembered, but I and then uh, people like you challenged me and said, show me the proof and said, well, uh, do you expect me to to photograph a poop of a chameleon? Come on, I'm a chameleon yes. or yes. what? You know? Yes. Okay. Okay. So I understand now. I do. You know? Yes. I collect poop. You know? I, in my order and my request. I, 
I order it and, and I photograph it now. And it is a spectacular area, which is like, despite of, of the like, 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 comics of it, you know, it gives you a very nice, a very nice picture of what is really physiological and what is not. Yeah, having seen hundreds and hundreds of poops uh, and uh, uh, urine samples uh, in the wild, uh, I have seen that out of the uh, dry season extremes, yeah, where, where you would of course get a dehydrated chameleon in the wild, and it would not be considered a physiological norm, yeah, because as we define the the naturalistic chameleonology, it is not about uh, making one-to-one -one what is out there. We have to take those things which are uh, vital, it means they, which contribute to the wellness of the chameleon, to its life, uh, uh, the quality of life, to its lifespan and so on. And these we have to mindfully and carefully simulate. And of course, we have to understand that some of the factors, either physically, one-to-one, -one, or at least at some degree are lethal. It means they cause the death of the chameleons in the wild. And these we have to, of course, eliminate. Yeah? This is what we, what we uh, um, again and again have to uh, explain. The people shout on us and say, oh, naturalistic. So you mean you will, you will have a cat in the cage, right? To, to be it, nat to have it yeah. natural. And, and you will infect them with the parasites, you know, and all the kinds so that it is natural. No, 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 no. It's, it's for captive animals, of course, unethical. Despite of the fact, you know, even in humans, there are very nice scholar articles about the positive influence, for instance, of, of helminth fauna on the setup of, uh, of uh, physiological mechanisms, specifically of the immuno, uh, immune system uh, in, in childhood. You know, if, if, you, if you was very in, in, in infested, you are, for instance, uh, very unlikely to get uh, uh, the Crohn disease. Yeah? Uh, mm -hmm. If you did not, the, the likelihood is by tens of uh, uh, percentage um, higher, yeah? and so on and so on. So, um, lethal and, and vital factors. Now, uh, what, uh, what, what is the physiological norm? When we see a chameleon outside of the onset of the rainy season and outside of the harsh dry season, the urate is bicolored. It is white and orange. The white part is the primary urine, which they produce in uh, simply taking out the uh, the salts of the of the um, of the excessive salts from the blood, you know, expelling them halfway, and then a second mechanism, reabsorption of still. Uh, uh, still existing content of water exists to save it for the environment. You remember, yeah, to save it inside mm -hmm. and not to 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 to, to uh, expel it, and this leads to this crystallic orange uh, the, the other structure. It is again the, the the same salts actually, but crystallized in a in a in the other way with less of water. Okay, and now the important factor is. To look at the portion yeah from outside you do not need to dissect you do not need to wait you just look at the entire urine and if the orange part is uh, less than 60 percent and more than about 15 this is a physiological um, uh, urine okay if it is whole white then the chameleon is overhydrated and if the content of the orange part is more than 50 or 60 percent, so building the majority of the poop, there we uh, are free to say this chameleon tends to be dehydrated. Okay, so it's not absence or presence. It is 15 to 60 percent is fine. White is bad and full orange is also bad. Yeah. Okay. This is what the Mother Nature showed us. Yeah. And uh, I, I looked at uh, whether we can simulate it in the, in the uh, captivity. And of course, I do not want to, exp uh, like to get to the extremes. Yeah? Uh, so, uh, sorry, I, I, I get to the overhydration extremes because it's very, very easy to overhydrate. 
I did not make it to 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 get to the dehydrated state because then it is unethical. So I do not want to do any uh, any experiments which which bring the chameleon on the edge of the of the uh, let's say comfort zone, and. Uh, uh, to uh, you can you can again uh, repeat this this um, um, experiments. Of course, they always depend on the uh, basic setup of your environment, which is in and around the cage in which you are the 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 uh, the experiment uh, conducting. Okay, so in my case, it was uh, an environment of my flat. Which uh, which is uh, about uh, all the time is is between uh, thirty to forty um, uh, percent uh, air humidity. Yeah, day and night all the time actually the same. Night time it goes a little bit up uh, and the temperature is, is dropping to eighteen seventeen degrees. And at the daytime it's uh, slightly exceeding twenty degrees. It means like it's uh, variating between sixty five and seventy five uh, degrees of Fahrenheit. Okay. In this setup of environment, I tried how I can keep the chameleons. And the first question was your question. Can you, Peter, keep the chameleons hydrated properly only with using fog? Uh, and then, uh, of course, I said, and, and what is the scale? Yeah, how, how, you can, how you can drive it, how we can modify it. So the first uh, question, I have good news. The answer is yes. You can you can uh, hydrate them in that type of environment, which is actually not far even from quite dry environment in the U.S. Yeah, where our colleagues are living somewhere, yeah, down in the Sonora or whatever. Yeah, mm -hmm. you can use fog as the only hydration method to keep your chameleon perfectly hydrated. Why? Because I could very easily gain this type of poop, this type of urine, which is physiological in the wild. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and you can you can simply uh, adjust and you need of course always to use several days because they also do not give urine uh, every single day so that you cannot uh, follow it uh, on, a, on a short time scale yeah so you little by little can add intensity of the fog and the length of the exposure okay so uh, roughly said if you if you expose in my environment the chameleon to a full stream fog for about five to seven hours a day, it gets overhydrated. It gets too much fog uh, and too much water. What it means, we, we get back to it. And uh, well, in yeah, general, yeah. it is an uh, uh, well, this is a state you do not want for for its uh, wellness. And uh, to get dehydrated. I needed to reduce the exposure to one day, five hours, one day per uh, per week to get it fully dehydrated. Okay. Anything between, yeah, delivered different stages of physiological poop and, and uh, physiological urine. And from my conclusion is exactly the range where we can play then with simulating the seasons yeah you of course can start the rainy season from the harsh dry season and you know pouring liters and liters and gallons of water which uh, very likely will be uh, will, like, the chameleon will survive but again it is in in the in the uh, artificial environment this is nothing that you should go don't go to the extremes yeah so you can very easily adjust yeah adding Length of the exposure and intensity, yeah, so that you get uh, within the range of, of the physiology. And once you get to the edge, you know, oh, oh so uh, I, I need to add, add more or I, I prolong the, the, the exposure. Very okay, simple. So if we were going to, uh, someone said, I want to try this, I want to yep. try this with my chameleon, what is an ideal setup to start with? Okay. Well, I would, I would say, you know, now ignoring that you can have uh, completely different environments, I would start with intermittent fogging, yeah, uh, of the exposure from twelve till six in the morning, one yeah. hour on, one hour off, one hour on, one hour off, okay, and this I would run for at least two two weeks, okay, to see what happens under 
majority of the of the situations this would be definitely enough for gink not to get to the de dehydrated state okay okay if yes two weeks uh, with that exposure is then uh, very quickly um, like um, may, like to make better it's it's easy so this would be from midnight till six in the morning one hour on one hour off and uh Again, uh, as we said, never use extremes. So uh, switch it to the middle level of, of the fogger so that you can then okay. adjust. That would be the basics. And then watch the urate. And uh, in the best case, please don't get um, uh, misleaded by one sample and be very careful that you get the whole urate. Yeah, because mm -hmm. because if you get just a fragment, it can be the orange one, you know, and you can say, oh, oh, dehydrated, and I need to rehydrate. But there is somewhere, you know, in the cage, uh, the big white piece piece missing. Okay, so get two samples. If they are uh, equal to each other, be almost sure that this is a good sign of of uh, like uh, having a good good sample what you can assess, and then you see. If, if it's on the edge, uh, it means uh, it is very little orange, then you can get less fog. Yeah? If you see it is v like very, uh, very white yeah? and very little portion of the orange, you just add intensity or you add one more cycle to the, to the fogging. And again, observe. When people do this for the first time, they're going to be nervous. Not only yeah. is this completely new and it's completely outside of our realm of understanding yeah. what drinking is and you have a whole lot of say noise in social media and stuff saying this doesn't yeah. work exactly so say somebody wants to try this and starts it off has a fogger we're going to be uh, fogging this chameleon between 12 and 6 every other hour one hour what kind of things can go wrong what should we be looking out for so we nip yeah. it in the bud before it's dangerous. Yeah. So we said that the, uh, the, the, the best sign of hydration is actually the, the form of the poop and, and urine. Yeah? The mis disadvantage of this is you cannot get it on a constant uh, basis. Yeah? You get it every two or three weeks yeah? uh, or yeah. every week. And if, if it goes strong. wrong, dehydrated, and you may not get it. Exactly. Anything. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, either... You go, you go brave way, okay? <laughs> and, and you keep up, you close your eyes and you say, I believe on that. And in that case, you watch for other signs of hydration, uh, overhydration on dehydration, the dehydration. There is a table, I can share it if you, if you want. I've, I've elaborated okay. on, this, on this topic because there are also other signs than the poop. For instance, there is a... Uh, skin test, which is even made by, by humans very often. Yeah, you know it. It's I very know. simple. You take just a, a piece of skin, yeah, and hold it with two two fingers, and you lose. If it goes within one second, like in my case, I'm well hydrated. If you if you get this piece of skin and it stays, yeah, then okay. the the water is not enough. So one one more one more test. Second uh, second issue. Okay. Watch, watch the, watch the muscles, watch the muscles and uh, structures which are underneath the skin, because a well hydrated chameleon, a little bit depending on the on the size and on on the age, but the well hydrated chameleon does not actually expose muscles and does not expose bones. They are invisible or they are visible only in extreme positions. Yeah, once you start seeing bones, it tends to be dehydration. Once you see swollen extremities, which look like, you know, like swollen one, like edematic, you know, it can be the other extreme. Mm -hmm. And last but not least, but last, you watch the eyes. Uh, the eyes are tricky. Uh, lots of people, and we know it from the, from the uh, social groups, yeah? uh, whenever the chameleon has a little bit sunken eyes in, in the eye holes, they, they shout out, oh, it's dehydrated. It is in the most cases not the, the, the truth, but a really heavily dehydrated chameleon can have sunken, sunken eye holes. Yeah? Okay. But watch the other, other signs. So this is the first advice I, I give. If you keep up and you want to be safe, 
observe also uh, other uh, aspects of, of the hydration and if they all uh, you know show towards well uh, good hydration be be fine if not make an adjustment the second okay. advice i i would give you if you are nervous bias you know the the life of a chameleon is much more important than than our experiment okay mm -hmm. so bias but then uh, be prepared that your experiment will not uh, be so um um how to say so significant the data will not uh, not run well yeah but as a tendency it, it is still fine what does it mean add other alternative uh, water uh, or hydration method to the fogging. Yeah. So, for instance, you can say, "Hey, let us stick with the fogging and let us put a dripper there." Yeah. Mm -hmm. What you, under normal circumstances, will see is that if the chameleon is well hydrated by the by the um, uh, nighttime humidity and fogging, it will not drink during the daytime. If it drinks, it might, but not necessarily. Yeah, they they tend sometimes to overhydrate also uh, the natural way, but it might get not enough water. If you are even more uh, nervous, okay, then at uh, evening and, and and morning spraying. Yeah, before the lights are on in the morning and after the lights are off in the evening. Why? Because we need the low temperature for high humidity, not to get this uh, stickiness of the air uh, and, and not, uh, not uh, the respiratory illness to, to appear. But in that case, you are super safe. The chameleon will very likely, as a tendency with the behavior, show you whether it needs it or not, but then you are super safe, but you bias a little bit the, the, yep. um, the, the experiment. All right. Now, you've said the word overhydration. Yeah. And I will fully admit this is something I have no experience with. I've concentrated my entire chameleon career helping people to avoid dehydration. Yeah. Never worried about overhydration. Totally new concept to me. Uh, obviously, we've talked about it before, but uh, it's still a new concept to me. Where did this idea come come from I, I realize overhydration can be a thing but i mean in humans people have died from drinking too much because they do stupid college contests yeah but that is an extreme case to say a chameleon is overhydrating is meaning that somehow they they are not able to stop their hydration and yeah. for an animal that lives in the through the rainy season that is is really hard for me to gather yeah, yeah. Uh, help okay me. let me let me let me bring a little bit light to your tunnel okay okay <laughs> uh, look uh, people uh very often say hey the uh, animal is smart enough and equipped from the mother nature to self-regulate properly so it knows what is the good amount of water what is not the good amount of water yeah and uh, you know um, it is not the case it is not the case in captivity because as much as we try still captivity is different than the wild yeah mm -hmm. whatever you do we are just yep, asymptotically yep. you know nearing the point but, but still there is a gap okay yep, yep. now uh, we, for instance, uh, that the animal. Uh, let's 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 speak about the uh, the Yemen chameleon, which is a very good model. You know, uh, it has just about six months to be born, grow up, uh, mate, lay eggs, and die. Okay. Now, sure. why it dies? It dies. In the most of the cases, because it is eaten by the by the uh, predators, yeah, but it might die also through the harshness of the winter time. Okay, mm -hmm. now the animal is by definition, by the mother nature, by the evolution, shaped by the environment as such, and not in not a constant, but also through the dynamics of the environment. You know, so the uh the animal uh 
is born or, or hatches uh, at the beginning of a rainy season. Yeah? After even the eggs were actually experiencing the last few weeks before the start of the rainy season to being too dry. So what they do, they come out and what they do, they get as much water as they can. Yeah. Now, in young animals, the overhydration is harder to achieve because they grow. You know, they dissolve the intake of the water with body growth and it, 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 by definition self self regulates. But as we know, specifically calyptrados are eating and feeding machines. You know why? Not because uh, whatever, because they have no time. They need to grow up and mate and die, yes. you know, within half a year. So they run, 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 and, and get whatever they can. And then once they come in uh, the uh, final phase in September, when the last rain comes, yeah, and they know, in parentheses, of course, this is the like the the genetic uh, memory. This is the, gen the 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 memory of the of the uh, evolutional lineage. Yeah, that from now until the beginning of March there will be no rain. So what they do, they take every drop water they can to to to, to bring reserves to their bodies to increase the chance of survival. Okay, and this is what some of the species do in the captivity as well. They do not drink because they need to. They drink because they are genetically set up to over drink a little bit, yeah, because they might not survive the winter, which we do not simulate for them. Okay, so no need to get them to that history of, oh my goodness, I will not get any drop of water for following four months. But we do not do this because this is a lethal factor which kills them. And we know we, 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 we must eliminate that. Yeah? So this is why we can get to the situation that they overhydrate. Now, uh, we can say, okay, if they drink too much, uh, it's not such a big, big issue. So uh, I have to say at the extremes, you know, it is same dangerous as the di dehydration. Two, uh, it's, it's uh, all the factors in all animals you can actually model in using the bell curve. Okay, the extremes are are deadly. Be it too much or too few, it is deadly. Uh, the optimum is somewhere in the middle of the bell curve. Yeah. So it, but it is a theory. Yeah. Now, what does it mean in concrete, and what is the physiological logic? And then what is the proof? The physiological logic of overhydration. Look, uh, for uh, keeping the internal environment stable, the uh, concentration of salts in the cells as one of the major factor of homeostasis is set up to certain level. It is set up even uh, in, in uh, the, the, the way how we, how we speak about it. It's the physiological solution. Yeah? It is a physio uh, um, uh, liquid. Yeah? What is it? It is the 1, oh, 0.1% uh, one, uh, 0 .1 solution of, of the, of the uh, NACL. It means the, the, the normal uh, cooking salt in our cells. If it is less, it is not good. If it is more, it is also not good. And this applies not only to salts, but also to other uh, other um, factors, other chemicals, which we use specifically for digestion. Yeah. So imagine that you need to digest something, you know, and you have a certain uh, concentration of some, uh, uh, for instance, ptyalin, yeah, which is a which is an enzyme which which dissolves sugars, yeah, and at certain, it is again bell curve, you know, at certain physiological concentration, it works perfectly, and if it's too concentrated, it does not work, and if it is too much dissolved, it also does not work. So in having too much water in the in the body. We cannot efficiently digest, yeah, and this is a big trouble, you know. So we 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 definitely influence all the turnover of all the nutrients in the body because they are uh, in too much water. This is one aspect. Second aspect is 
look, if we accept yeah, for, 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 for this debate now, let us exp uh, accept that we say, okay, the primary source or uh, let's say a dominant, okay, a dominant source of hydration of chameleons is based on uh, the experiments and on how it looks like and, and how the captivity uh, uh, tends to, to uh, confirm. It is the nighttime fogging. So it means for tens of millions of years, these animals uh, take in water using fog. Uh, no doubt that they are capable of drinking liquid water, but from that perspective, this is not the dominant physiological mechanism. Okay, so what does it mean? If they drink too much water, where does it get? It does not get directly to the blood through the, through the um, uh, nebulization process, uh, which, which we dis described, but it gets to the uh, uh, intestinal tract, okay? And too much water in the intestinal tract means that the cells, if they are not used to that low concentration which is uh, obviously the, the natural water which, which they get from the rain, which is actually uh, distilled water, plus minus. Yeah? They are not used to too much water in this state. What they do, they grow. They suck in, because they, are, they have a salt content inside, they grow, they take in the water, and they rupture. And the same mechanism as I described uh, for the lungs, happens in the intestine. So the wall of the intestine is full of small, tiny microscopic ruptures of cells. And these cells cannot then digest properly. What they do, they are little wounds, which are gates for infection if it comes in. And if, of course, comes in, because again, ingestion uh, uh, and then taking in the food is a very good gate for all airborne diseases and then germs, be it, you know, whatever, you name it, yeah? And then okay. the wall of the intestine gets infected. And it's, um, uh, if it's infected, then we should see it somehow. And luckily, we can see it. We do not see it on a urate, but we see it on the composition and on the, on the form of the poop. Uh, black and white, yeah? The... the, 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 the bad sign of a poop is that it is other color than black. The physiological poop looks like, uh, I would say, the, the, um, uh, the stones of, of olives, yeah? mm -hmm. solid, dry. Uh, if you take it in your fingers, it either keeps or you can even like smash it in, in powder. You know, and this is the physiological state of the of the poop. Once it is other color than deep black, you should be con concerned, and specifically you should be concerned if it is um, if it is uh, sticky, if it is not formed in, into these small blackish bites, but it's you know somehow somehow um, uh, heterogeneous. And specifically, if it has the color of uh, whitish or grayish uh, sluggish substance, which additionally stinks badly, because physiological chameleon poop does not stink. Yeah. So once you get this, yeah, this is the sign of of overhydration. Why? Because this is the result of not properly working digestion of chronical, usually if, 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 if you repeat it and you expose the chameleon to overhydration repeatedly, you know, you get it ongoingly and ongoingly the animal is not fine. It is like with smoking. You do not kill it with, with uh, the three milliliters of water at once, but you shorten its lifespan by one or two or three years. Yeah, because this little discomfort, little discomfort, little discomfort aggregates, yeah, and shortens the lifespan of the animal. Why? If it's if, if we can regulate it. Once you get the, the poop like that, you know, and you have a, a captive born, uh, clear of parasites uh, animal, then you are almost sure that it's overhydrated. You need to reduce the, the content of water in the intestine. How you can do it? Uh, you can you can do it in, in in proper hydration, which means fogging, not 
letting it drink. What I am having trouble with is uh, you're talking about overhydration as if it's something that we can accidentally do. And, okay, we let, let our fogger go on for six yeah. hours instead of three hours. Yeah, it can happen, yeah. And that just, I, I have a hard time understanding how that can happen after being in Madagascar during the rainy season. And it is always high humidity. Uh, the entire night was this whole fog yeah. bank out in Rana Mafana. Yeah. And there's rain all the time. So this chameleon is immersed in this highly hydration uh, environment for months on end. Uh, how is it that they would be able to survive yeah. that, but that we well, can just accidentally... Oops. Yeah, yeah. I'll tell you. Look, uh, again, it is not one or uh, zero or 100. It is always a clinal vari variation. It is always that the environment changes and the animal reacts on, on um, the environment proper way in the cycles, uh, which means you are right that if you are there in the rainy season, the chameleons are overhydrated. They are. You get, you get the same pattern as you get in the, in the uh, captivity. Uh, but because it happens in the natural environment, yeah, where everything is natural, yeah, they can cope with it better than in the natural, unnatural environment, as we said, which uh, differs a little, whatever we do, uh, from the real natural environment, and they cannot adjust so quickly because we still know not enough. So it is like that, that in the, uh, and this is why I said, you know, outside of the onset of the rainy season and outside of the harshest dry season, we can adjust, uh, we can see the physiological uh, poop and physiological behavior. In this uh, 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 um, periods of year where, yes, uh, literally the, the water is pouring from everywhere, you know, and they cannot even, you know, open the mouth to breathe without, you know, taking some water in. Mm -hmm. Yes, they overhydrate it even, even in, in the wild, yeah? But it's short term and they can regulate it. And at the, at the other uh, end, you know, before they die, believe me, in the harshest period of, of dryness, they are heavily dehydrated. From the yep. whole lifespan uh, and, and the whole cycle perspective, this is part of their life, but it's that these are the, uh, the extremes which kill them and which are out of our scope if we, if we talk uh, naturalistic uh, uh, chameleonology. Okay. Does it make sense? Enough that I can think on this. And for the audience, this is natural. Uh, Peter and I have a long history of thinking about these things over spans of years. And then... Uh, if it when it finally clicks, I say, oh, "Okay, I'll make a podcast episode and I explain it in, in my best way." So uh, we'll, we'll just say, "I'm understanding what you're saying. I'm going to think about it." Okay, and, uh, we'll go through the normal evolution of things. I, I so, will show you the dry season, and you will see the, you will see dehydrated chameleons as well. You know, this is what I'm counting yeah. on. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Is there anything else you would like to uh, share with? people who are just starting off with fogging and want to try it well uh, yes i i would like to and i would uh, i would actually uh, i would like to get really to the basics yeah uh, we started with with your speech about the importance of the nature as the source of information of this little tiny extremely important pieces that built as a mosaic the environment and built the framework for us to uh, meaningfully uh, simulate the natural uh, conditions and I, I would like uh, really to to like focus on it and and, uh, and inspire people uh, to do it and, and, and go the same path together with us because I believe this is the only meaningful way. Uh, please uh, be very careful uh, if other philosophies uh, come to the light of the day. 
saying something that does not make sense. You see, uh, we, we explore, yeah? We sometimes do not know. Some, some, some things we know, for some things we have data, for something we have proofs, and for something we have theories, general ideas, uh, um, physics, uh, physiology, and so on, yeah? But if something does not make sense, please be very careful to listen to, to, to uh, this, this, this advice, yeah? One specific advice, which has, uh, very surprisingly for me, found the way to uh, social media, is uh, drastically uh, and uh, incorrectly simplified recommendation of hydration using water balls. Okay, I will not now go to the to the details. I have just to say, if you would ask me, how many times I have seen. Uh, Camillians drinking in the wild, I tell you, like frankly, not even a single time ever. And uh, if you ask me, and Peter, how many water bowls or water buddies or water uh, sources have you seen in the environment of the Camillians that could be, uh, you know, theoretically used for drinking big amounts of liquid water in the environment? I would again tell you, I, I, I don't know them. Yeah, They are almost absent. Why? Camillians live in, high in the trees. Climb up the trees. I, I've done it many, many times. You know, Climb up the trees and look around. Find, find please a pool there. You will not find it. Yeah. Second, uh, of course, uh, uh, the, 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 there can be, it can be um, like misunderstandings like Camillians live or very often along big water bodies, along rivers, uh, along streams, and so on. Yes, but they sit up there in the environment as a rule, and you of course can sometimes uh, see them walking in in the in the environment. But and you can even by accident uh, see it uh, falling into a, a stream and and swimming. They are capable of it, but they do not do it on a regular basis. Otherwise. You would you would very likely not find the chameleons because they would be eaten. They are safe up there. They are extremely unsafe walking because they are slow. They are colorful. They 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 move strange way and so on. Yeah, they would they would they would be eaten and they are not eaten. They they build strong populations and even from the beginning of uh, of their life cycle when they are born, the first thing they do, they go up. They don't seek for any pool and so on. So if advice, which is strange, comes, yeah, my advice is ask yourself whether it makes sense. Ask yourself whether, like the Mother Nature or the dear God, has really designed the environment in that way that it would fit. And if it does not make sense, uh, be very careful. Yeah, I am the first to say, hey, I do not know everything. Yeah, I have... Every day I learn something new, yeah. But if it's if it's extremely strange and extremely unlikely, then please better listen to someone that has seen it thousands and thousands of times. Listen to Bill, who has who has dedicated his life, you know, to exploring and challenging even scientists and and uh, and people like me, you know, and 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 proving every single word I say with proof. Uh, uh, evidence and and example and 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 take me with you and and let us see it together. Yeah, uh, trust to to trustful sources. Be very careful exposing uh, your animals, which are so beautiful, but so delicate and so uh, you know uh, uh, harmable uh, through even tiny little things, which are very important to them. Uh, to uh, uh, so that so that you can really like with a with a good um, sense of you know responsibility say yes I'm really confident I do for my chameleons what makes sense what has been proven and what is what is uh, really like uh, close to the nature where they come from and do not experiment in things that that, that do do not make 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 sense uh, if you are in this boat. 
you are cordially welcome uh, and we will definitely take you on on many journeys of uh, uh, adventurous trips to the jungles and 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 the deepest corners of our cages and research and and so on to to step by step elucidate more and more secrets of the of the life of these fantastic uh, f- fantastic animals let's be in the same boat in protecting them giving them the best what we can because this is what i believe uh, we owe to them we are the ones that take them out of the wild and make the difference between wild and and uh, an artificial environment we owe them to be taken seriously not to be taken as a piece of property or ownership but as a as a partner which uh, really if if you if you observe and if you if you pay attention uh, and and study will will teach you so many uh so many um like good things for your life for um for how to treat yourself how to treat other people how to treat other animals you know uh that you will always be in debt to chameleons you you cannot overpay overpay what they will what they will give you and you know sitting on the on the branch uh the whole and entire uh, evolution of mankind and watching us uh with their tails curled and uh, eyes uh you know uh, observing what these strange um, uh beings do uh, uh give the, give them respect what they deserve sounds good all right peter thank you very much and uh, so much of welcome we'll see you next time Thank you. Every time you need me, I'm here to share. Thank you very much, Peter, for joining us and talking about fogging and chameleons. And for everybody else, I thank you for joining. When we get new information like this about fogging, it's up to us to decide when we're going to accept it or what it's going to take for us to accept. What kind of evidence are we looking for? And this is very healthy. Uh, You do want to be skeptical about things that come around. And so put up some tests and figure out what you need to convince you to go in this direction. Me personally, it's worked very well for many years, and it answers a number of questions about chameleons and how they survive in the wild. And so I am confident that this is an important aspect to chameleon husbandry going forward. And if you have further questions about fogging, you're welcome to join me on one of my live sessions. Tuesday nights at 5 p.m. Pacific, I do a live on Instagram, and on Saturday noon Pacific, I do lives on YouTube. And so I invite you to come to one of those live sessions where you can ask your questions, comments, interact live with me and everybody else that joins on that day. Thank you for joining me here. It's time for me to go work on the next episode. Until then, take care of yourselves and give that chameleon of yours a nice juicy silkworm from me. This is Bill Strand signing off. See you next time. 